Good morning and welcome to the 106th Learn with Lorna on the subject of the crossing of the three firths. My name is Lorna Steele McGinn and I'm the Community Engagement Officer with the Highland Archive Service. My job involves all sorts of activities online and in person, giving talks, going to schools, uh, all sorts of things designed to communicate and share the wonderful collections that we look after at the Highland Archive Service with as many people as may be uh, interested in finding out about them. The Highland Archive Service, if you're not familiar, has four archive centres in the Highlands of Scotland. We have uh, the Highland Archive Centre in Inverness, Nucleus Nuclear and Caithness Archives in Wick, Lochaber Archive Centre in Fort William and Sky and Lochalsh Archives in Portree. And together those four make up the Highland Archive Service that look after historic documents dating from the 1200s to the present day, all relating to uh, this lovely and beautiful part of the world. This series, Learn with Lorna, is brought to you by High Life Highland at no cost to the viewer. High Life Highland is a charity registered in Scotland and there's no payment or subscription required to take part in this series of talks. But if you're able to donate towards our work, then we're very, very grateful for that. Thank you so much to those of you who have done so and to those of you who were able to do so last weekend, uh, the first weekend in April when we were taking part in the Highland Action for Ukraine weekend and all of our uh, proceeds in the whole of High Life Island went to Disasters Emergency Committee uh, Appeal for Ukraine. So thank you so much if you were one of the people who did that. As I mentioned last week, this week's is pre-recorded because I'm out speaking at a series of workshops uh, today. But we're into a new month and therefore a new theme and our theme for April is On The Move where we'll be looking at subjects to do with transport, infrastructure and the movement of people, whether due to uh, military service, work opportunities or other reasons. This week we're looking at the story of the crossing of the Three Firths, a 20th century story which transformed the Highland landscape and the lives of those of us who live, work and visit the Highlands. Now those people who do live in the Highlands who are watching may well know, uh, I'm sure, which, which particular firths I'm talking about, but I thought I would be helpful uh, in starting by locating us for those of you who maybe are not as familiar with the landscape of the Highlands. First of all, a point on the terminology. I'm sure that um, I'm preaching to the converted here and you will, will all know this, but a firth is a narrow inlet of, uh, of sea, uh, uh, like an estuary, and there are firths all around the Scottish coastline. And the three we're talking about today are the Murray Firth, which goes into the Bewley Firth, the Cromarty Firth and the Dornoch Firth. And if you're looking at a map of the Highlands, and if you don't have one handy, never fear, because I do. If you're looking at a map of the Highlands, this is the right hand side of the Highlands. And these are the three large inlets of water that you can see coming in here on the right hand side. So Moving up the coast, we have the Murray Firth here, just above Inverness, so Inverness being here. Um, the Murray Firth, which as I say, goes into the Bewley Firth here. And then above that, the Cromarty Firth. So you can see the Black Isle here and Cromarty up the top of the Black Isle. And then the Dornoch Firth up at the top here with Tain and Dornoch above it. So these are the three uh, pieces of land that I'll be talking about and today they are crossed respectively by the Keswick Bridge here, the Cromarty Bridge here and the Dornoch Firth Bridge here. Please obviously do feel free to take some more time to have a look at your own maps but I thought it might be helpful to uh, locate you to start with. Now those three bridges now are all part of the road that is so much associated with the Highlands the A9, which travels up from the central belt right to the very top of the country, runs up the whole spine of the country. Now, it might seem to us absolutely obvious that those three bridges were necessary, but it was actually a long fought battle to get them built and a battle that very nearly didn't succeed. And as I say at the beginning, a battle that is in very recent memory. And if you have memories of this, please do share. And I know certainly Several of my colleagues uh, have shared their memories of the buildings, of the building of these bridges with me. So if you have any memories, please do share them. 
it's quite nice for us to do something that is so recent. So how did these three bridges come about? And I will talk specifically about the construction of the bridges, how that came about, rather than focusing much on the stories of the ferries that were there before. I've previously done a talk on boats and ferries, and I'm not ignoring that subject today, but I'm going to focus particularly on the construction of these bridges. So how did they come about? Well, largely the work of three men, Ray Clark, John Smith and Pat Hunter Gordon. Now, in the 1950s and 1960s, there was a boom in road building across the UK, with the first stretch of motorway in Britain being opened in 1958 and the first in Scotland in 1964. Also in 1964, the Forth Road Bridge opened and then the Tay Road Bridge followed two years later. Now, of course, those bridges are absolutely out with the Highland area, but it's important, I think, to get a sense of the momentum of the road building and the bridge building that was happening right across the country. So there was a real momentum in infrastructure development, improving communications uh, happening at the time. And the benefits were being seen. Time and money were being saved by businesses, workers and tourists who were now able to take shorter journeys across um, pieces of land or pieces of water rather than having these long, uh, circuitous routes. So there was a lot happening, particularly in, in England, some starting to happen in the central belt of Scotland. But in Scotland, really, it wasn't going fast enough. And the Tootill Committee was set up in 1959 to examine the state of the Scottish economy and make recommendations. And one of the issues that that committee highlighted was the transport costs incurred by Scottish industries when trying to develop new industries and new markets and keep up with the Central Belt or the rest of the UK. So there was a, a feeling that Scottish, Scottish businesses that were not linked by good infrastructure, by good roads, by bridges, was in danger of falling behind and that there would be such a huge additional cost on them in transporting material that there would they would start to fall uh, massively behind. Now, in a pamphlet about this subject, the crossing of the three firths, these specific Highland issues are recorded. And this is an extract from that booklet. It's called The Highland Problem. We always love it when something's entitled The Highland Problem. OK, the recommendations of the Tootill report apply equally to the Highlands of Scotland, where there is a united call from industry, farmers and transport operators for major improvements to the A9 road between Perth and Inverness. Improvements which could mean or would mean the elimination of low bridges, bad corners and weight restrictions. They also ask for stretches of dual carriageway in suitable places to enable the faster traffic to pass heavy lorries and caravans. It is understood that the preparation of schemes for the A9 Perth Green Loaning and the A9 Perth Pitlochry Roads will also be considered when the feasibility studies mentioned in the introduction are completed. This means that under the present priorities, improvements to the main arterial road between Perth and Inverness are some 10 years away unless the priority is improved. So they're saying, yes, the Tootill Committee is calling for, uh, you know, a speed it up and, and improvement to, to infrastructure, but the Highlands are even further behind that in a priority list. And we need bits of dual carriageway, we need more suitable roads, we've got bridges, uh, lorries and buses passing through tiny tight corners and little bridges. So there's a huge amount that needs to be done in the Highlands, but we are far behind. If the main arterial road is 10 years away, um, then we're even further away than this. And as I say, that was in the late 1950s, early 1960s that this report was published. Now, Professor Sir Robert Grieve, who's the chairman of the Highlands and Islands Development Board, said this. Transport to the Highlander, and even more to the Islander, is something that makes a constant impact on his daily life, and in consequence, he takes the closest interest in its operation and provision. Because so many of the necessities of life come from faraway places, any increase in transport costs automatically affect the cost of living right across the board. Transport too, as we well know, 
is of vital interest to potential developers, and usually it is one of the first things they ask about. It is pretty clear, therefore, that transport development must be one of the cornerstones of our strategy. So there was absolutely an awareness that infrastructure improvements were needed in the Highlands. And anyone, again, anyone who's watching from the Highlands will be well aware of the fact that those additional transport costs uh, are, still cause us an issue. So what was the best way forward in terms of not only connecting that Perth to, Perth, uh, Perth to Inverness main arterial road, but beyond that into the Highlands? Well, the plan initially was to take the road around the head of the three firths. So if I get my map back again, the original plan was to take this road from Inverness, once it got, uh, once the road had been improved to there, all the way in here into the Bewley Firth and then up and then all the way in again round the Cromarty Firth and then up and then all the way in again round the Dornoch Firth. So following that coastline. But some people saw that there would be a huge wasted opportunity if the firths weren't bridged at this point. Why not invest the money in the construction of bridges and earn the thanks of future generations was how it was worded in the pamphlet. Let me read this to you. This is fantastic. This is the, those three men I mentioned, uh, Ray Clark, uh, John Smith and uh, Pat Hunter Gordon, imagining themselves in 1980. Imagine the heady future of 1980. Transport 1980. Let us suppose that the year is 1980 and a firm has been allocated a factory site in the newly reclaimed area in east of Invergordon. The benefits of deep water for shipping, ample supplies of fresh water and level stable land for building are readily available. Dalcross, the airport for the region and the new freightliner terminal at Inverness lie to the south across two firths, but only 15 miles away as the crow flies. How would the potential industrialist prefer the connecting road to run? Would he like it to follow the line of the existing trunk road A9, which meanders along the shoreline and round the head of each firth? Or would he prefer the direct route by bridge and causeway straight from the industrial sites near Invergordon to the administrative capital of Inverness? Consider a transport manager responsible for moving goods out of the new freightliner terminal at Inverness to customers in the north and west. Would he not prefer to see his lorries rolling straight over the Bewley Firth by a new bridge at the Keswick Narrows, and thence by fast direct roads to Muraboard or Edmonton or beyond? Or surely anyone, Highland Board official with business in Tain, Sutherland farmer sell selling stock in the Inverness markets, or newly settled smelter worker taking his wife to the capital of the Highlands for an evening out? Surely all of them will bless the planners of today if he can go straight to his destination. And this was the plan that was outlined by these three men, Edgerton Farmer, Ray Clark, Dr John Smith, a geography lecturer at Aberdeen University. These two men, sorry, at that point, the two men, they outlined this plan when they were invited to speak to Inverness Royal Academy students, or a variety of students actually, at the Academy in Inverness. Ray Clark had been invited to give this lecture in his role as the chair of the National Farming Union Easter Ross Land Use Committee. And in this document, uh, Ray Clark remembers how he came to give that lecture, why he was asked to think about the subject, and what happened that day in 1969 when he received an initial phone call asking him about whether he would give a lecture. That telephone call was made by the rector of Inverness Academy who rang up to invite me to take part in a conference that he proposed to hold for all sixth form pupils from Tain to Newton Moor. The subject was to be which way ahead for the Highlands, and he wished me to cover farming and land use. The other speakers were to be the chairman of the Highlands and Islands Development Board, the head of the Scottish Tourist Board, and the chairman of the Crofters Commission. We were all to speak for three quarters of an hour, and there would be no facility for showing slides. I reckoned that if the pupils were not to be asleep by the time we had all spoken, I'd better do something about it. Something I uh, 
feel as well when I have no slides to share with you. I think, I wonder if people are sitting at home asleep. So he's thought, you know, I can't, I can't just talk and talk at these students. What am I going to do? I thought that I should prepare a large map of the area and show it on it the problems of the present and the possibilities for the future. The Jack Holmes Group had fairly recently produced a report for the Highlands and Islands Development uh, for the Highlands and Islands Development Board called Murray Firth, a plan for growth. In that report, they had said that a population of 250,000 to 300,000 people could be settled around the Bewley and Cromarty Firths with the houses, jobs, roads and shops that such a population would require. The report was a most professional document with many plans, sketches and diagrams, but all the housing was sited on some of the best arable land in the Highlands. There is little arable land in the Highlands. It amounts to only 7% of the 9 million acres that make up the whole area. The proposed trunk road from Inverness to Invergordon would cut through good arable land by going around the head of the Firths, through Bewley, Murevord and Dingwall. It would be dual carriageway and on a new alignment. To me, it seemed like a long way around to Invergordon when the direct route across the Firths would be 15 miles shorter. Dr John Smith, senior lecturer in geography at Aberdeen University, was a friend of mine and he knew the area well. One Saturday night on the kitchen table in Edderton Farmhouse with the aid of a bottle of sherry, he and I drew the map of the Murray Firth Basin. We moved all the Jack Holmes proposed settlements off the class 1, 2 and 3 land, the arable land, and recited them on class 4 land, areas of rough grazing and forest. When that had been done, it became obvious that the correct route for the trunk road was directly north across the Firths. Such a road would connect Inverness with Tain, Sutherland and the North and not just stop at Invergordon. We made a large coloured map of all of this and John took it back to Aberdeen to give it the final touches. At the conference, I hung it up for all 215 pupils to see and I talked about land and the future of the Highland countryside. They were an interested audience and the questions afterwards were very good. I wonder if any of those students who must now be in their late 30s remember that day. I do. After it was all over, Tony Pledger, the Scotsman correspondent, who had been there all day with the press, came up to me and asked if I would write an article on our proposals, particularly with regard to the direct route north. And so we start to see how the genesis of this came about, that Ray Clark Interestingly, it had come about it. You've got that um, the context of developing in, uh, developing industry and the fear of the Highlands being left behind. But Ray Clark has come at it from a land management point of view as a farmer and looked at it and gone, we're, we're going to lose a huge amount of our limited good arable land. And it's just not necessary. Is there not another way around that? So here we have two of the three men who were behind the project, Ray Clark and John Smith. How did the third man come on board? Well, the Scotsman, uh, the journalist who approached Ray Clark at the end of that lecture, they did indeed do a feature on it. And when they published Ray's article, one of the people who read it was Major Pat Hunter Gordon, who some may remember uh, as the head of AI Welders in Inverness, who I spoke about uh, when I did the AI Welders talk way back <laughs> um, when I started this series. Now, Pat Hunter Gordon was a key, key person in lots of different ways in the Highlands. And he had been a member of the Cairncroft Committee, which had been set up in 1952 to look into the Scottish economy. And the Tootill Report had come out of that. So he again was a person hugely already involved and aware of this subject. Now, Pat Hunter Gordon read the Scotsman article and contacted Ray Clark. And as a result of that, Ray Clark came to Inverness. They spoke at length about the, the project and the ideas. And from that point on, Pat Hunter Gordon took charge of pushing this project through and trying to make sure that the bridges were constructed. Together, these three men wrote the booklet, The Crossing of the Three Firths, and they distributed it to a really wide range of movers and shakers, MPs, councillors, government ministers, they lobbied parliament, they rallied local support, and they really campaigned strenuously and actively for this. 
In their booklet, they proposed the construction of three bridges, and they gave the opinion that constructing these three bridges would save time and miles, and they detailed all the differences that it would make. So, for instance, it would take 25 miles off the journey from Inverness to Dornoch, and they did this for a variety of places. They also said that it would clear the bottlenecks that were constantly building up in Inverness, Dingwall and Bewley. They said it would open up new areas to tourists, so the Black Isle, Tain and Dornoch would be much more easily accessible. They said that it would increase commuter potential, so people could live on the Black Isle and commute to Inverness, as they do in their thousands now. They said it would provide spaces for industrial development with improved communication. And they would said it would take away the danger of the long route happening and wasting good arable farmland. They researched and noted other bridges that had been successfully built, i.e. in Norway, and this was the conclusion of uh, this publication. They said the building of the bridges across the firths will further increase the knowledge of British en engineers in this field and increase their competitiveness in export markets, create an attraction for both planners and tourists, and be the artery that could transfuse, transfuse life into the extreme north. So they're, they're campaigning on a lot of platforms there, you know, they're campaigning for farmland, for uh, infrastructure, for uh, business, for tourists, all sorts of things. And as I said, um, they, they sent this booklet out to a huge, wide ranging audience. They also called a press conference uh, in Inverness to launch their booklet and it was met with a huge amount of support. And another contemporary Scotsman report, so they were, there, were very, there were other newspapers there, but uh, uh, the Scotsman report at the time outlined the three men's plan like this. For spreading the benefit of the investment at Invergordon over a far wider area, so you may remember at this point there was talk of starting the, the aluminium smelter in, in Invergordon. But these three men as, as locals and local business owners and, and people aware of the local situation didn't want just one place to benefit from it. They wanted that huge influx of people that would come to Invergordon to benefit a much wider area. They believed that their plan was superior. They wanted a 24 foot wide road crossing, uh, a road crossing the Bewley Firth by a high level bridge or causeway and opening bridge. The road would then climb over the ridge of the Black Isle and down to cross the Cromarty Firth by a causeway where the Firth shallows opposite Eventon. After following the present A9 road as far as Allness, the direct route would cut between the existing A9 and the Struy bypass to cross the Dornach Firth by a high level bridge at Meikle Ferry and to link up with the existing A9 route to Wick and Thurso. Major Hunter Gordon said it would be a tremendously exciting project, very worthwhile. He emphasised that future generations would be saddled forever with a wrong decision taken now on the future of the North Route. Mr Clark agreed that the plan was another shot in his campaign to avoid good ag agricultural land being swallowed up by growth in the Murray Firth area. Compared to the roundabout route, there would be a saving of 14 miles on road construction between Inverness and Invergordon. There would be no delay to the trunk road traffic during construction, so obviously they wouldn't have to close the road if they had which is what they would have to do if they were just duelling it. With the dual carriageway plan, said Mr Clark, there would be at least eight years of constru construction work with delays. The pamphlet said that a causeway over the Cromarty Firth would open up land reclamation, freshwater storage and hydroelectric possibilities. There would also be a saving in minor bridge construction, only seven streams to cross, compared with 21 round the Firths to Invergordon. There's also a focus there on um, making the most of the natural advantages that the Highland landscape had, so capitalising on the land and sea, and also a focus on the duty of care that they had to the environment. So was it a foregone conclusion then, now that these three man, men had campaigned and, and raised the issue, was it a foregone conclusion that that would all just happen? Well, no, it wasn't. The Highlands and Islands Development Board, who had been involved in that initial Jack Holmes report, which had suggested just duelling the old road. The Highlands and Islands Development Board stuck by that report. Ray Clark uh, described them as being bitterly opposed to the new proposed project. 
Mr Prophet Smith, who is a member of the Highlands and Islands Development Board, gave this interview to the Northern Chronicle. He said, this is an interesting pamphlet and those who produced it have made out quite a strong case, but we considered all of this some time ago and rejected it. It's a case of balancing certain advantages against disadvantages, and when this is done in the whole context of future development in the Murray Firth area, there is little doubt in the mind of the board that the new road should follow the natural U-shape of the Firths. The view of the board is, said Mr Smith, that the road around the Firths would be the most advantageous. We welcome the pamphlet as a useful contribution to the discussion on development, but we do not have to agree with it. We have made our representations to the government on what we believe the priorities of the 1970s are, and we see no reason to change those views. Pat Hunter Gordon's response to that comment was to say, we're not saying our plan is right, but it should not be rejected by the board until they have found out the reactions of the people who matter, the business people on whom the Highlands will grow. And this tug of war continued. Um, but it's, and it's funny because I, I know the results, so I have an opinion on it because I know the results. Um, but really, you know, without being there, it's it's hard to say what the, uh, the different feelings and different uh, cases being put forward. But this backwards and forwards between the two opinions continued. But it seems likely that one of the deciding factors was the fact that the bridge direct route, even with three bridges needing to be constructed, worked out cheaper. And of course, everybody always likes uh, something to work out as the cheapest option. Ray Clark remembers it in this way. There came then another of the strange twists of fate in the tail of the three bridges. A general election was held, the government changed, and the Right Honourable Gordon Campbell was appointed Secretary of State for Scotland. He ordered a survey to be carried out on eight possible routes for the main road north from Inverness. The route proposed by the Highlands and Islands Development Board was estimated to cost 14.27 million, while the direct route, more or less on the lines that we had proposed, worked out at 11.4 million. The shortest distance between two points was still a straight line, and the shorter the road, uh, the less the cost, even with three firths to bridge. And so gradually the decision was made to go ahead with the crossing of the three firths with the bridges. Due to the hard work, the vision and the persuasive, persuasive abilities and, and sheer perseverance of Pat Hunter Gordon, Ray Clark and John Smith. And work started on the Cromarty Bridge in 1977. Cromarty Bridge, as I say, came first out of the three. When it opened in 1979, it was the longest bridge ever built in the Highlands at nearly a mile long, uh, 4,800 4, feet long and it was built at a cost of 4.5 million. Now the construction was problematic because the piles supporting the bridge had to be driven 400 feet into the mud while barges moved the concrete supplies backwards and forwards in the Cromarty Firth. The bridge is very low lying, the Cromarty Bridge is very low lying, and it was designed specifically to resemble a causeway with 68 spans and to have a minimal effect on the tide movement and the resident wildlife. So that vision there of, of keeping it a, a level of loyalty to the environment and the, the natural landscape remained. As I said, it was opened in 1979 by Gregor Mackenzie, MP, who, uh, MP and Minister for Industry. But one of the great sadnesses of this story, and it's a sadness that I've come across in other subjects as well, um, is the fact that Pat Hunter Gordon died uh, not having able to not having lived to see uh, this project through as he tragically died in a car accident in 1978. A huge loss to the Highlands and that's why I say I've talked about him before um, in, in the loss that he was to AI welders as an industry and the loss to this project as well and so he never uh, lived to see the opening even of the first of those three bridges, despite the huge role that he had played in campaigning for them. His wife, who was a, a, an extraordinary woman in her own right, uh, was there as a special guest. Three years later, in 1982, the Keswick Bridge opened, 40 years ago this year. After a number of delays and some costing issues, it had been started in 1978 and took four years. 
Now the Kesset Bridge, unlike the Cromarty Bridge, is not low lying. Instead, where the Cromarty Bridge had to consider keeping it very low and close to the water to not impact the tides, the, the people building the Kesset Bridge had a load of other factors to consider. The Bewley Firth, from the Murray Firth into the Bewley Firth, still needed to be accessible to ships, so the bridge needed to be much higher. The area is often subject to very high winds, so sections of the bridge had to be wind tested in factories. And perhaps most uh, strikingly, the bridge is built right across the Great Glen fault line, which required hydraulic seismic buffers to be built into the bridge in case of earth tremors. We hold some fantastic newspaper special editions recording the opening of the Keswick Bridge, interviews with the Keswick Ferry captain uh, talking about the last sailings of the Keswick Ferry, interviews with local businesses, huge numbers of adverts of local businesses tempting people to come over to the other side, whether that's coming to the Black Isle for a, a holiday or come to Inverness for your dinner because you'll be able to get home so quickly, um, interviews with bridge workers and local industries and a huge number of others, com commemorative uh, publications about the opening of the Kesset Bridge. The Cable Stayed Bridge, so as I say, it's a totally different from the, the Cromarty Bridge, which is very flat. The Kesset Bridge has those very clear uh, spans and four towers. And it's now an absolute landmark of Inverness, particularly um, in the night where it's uh, brightly lit up. But it carries tens of thousands of cars a day now. It's category B listed and it's featured on the Bank of Scotland £100 notes. The final bridge of the three was, of course, the Dornoch Firth Bridge. The contract for building this was awarded in 1988 and the bridge was completed and opened in August 1991 by Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother. The Dornoch Firth Bridge was built using a particular technique which allowed it to be built in sections in factory conditions behind the south abutment and then each part section would be launched out across the Firth. It was the largest bridge in Britain to be built using that technique and one of the largest in Europe and that bridge had the challenge, again a different challenge from the other two, of the fact that both the north and the south ends were situated in areas of special scientific interest, meaning that they had to protect tidal flows, bird habitats and mussel beds. So all three of them had their own unique challenges to uh, overcome. Ray Clark was the first person to cross the Dornoch Firth Bridge, which I like. As I say, Pat Hunter Gordon passed away in 1978, very uh, unexpectedly and tragically. John Smith died in 2004 and Ray Clark in 2017 leaving behind, the three of them leaving behind, this extraordinary legacy, the story of the crossing of the three firths, something that those of us who live here take very much for granted. And to be honest, until I started working with the Archive Centre, I had absolutely no idea that these bridges were so recent. When you grow up with something, they're just, they, you assume they've always been there. And in fact, the Keswick Bridge is only one year older than me. So for me, it has always been there. Um, but, you know, such a very, very recent change that's made such a difference. I hope you've enjoyed finding out about the story of the crossing of the three firths. And you can join me next week where I'll be looking at customs and excise records held in the Highland Archive Centre and the Nuclear and Caithness Archives. So I hope you can join me for that. But a reminder in the meantime that uh, this series is brought to you by High Life Highland at no cost to the viewer. High Life Highland is a charity registered in Scotland and there's no payment or subscription required to take part in this series of talks. If you're able to donate towards our work, then please do so. We're very, very grateful for it. And I will see you next week. Thank you.